Uh, sorry for the delay. We've had some technical issues with uh, YouTube live streaming. Now we've resolved those. Everything should be fine. Anyone at home could watch this. And this will be also recorded for watching it later if you want. All right, welcome to our second IIT Boston meetup. Uh, we had our first one in January, and this is our second one. Today we have uh, two speakers, uh, Matthew McNeely, the founder of uh, Nimble Industry, and also Joe Kenny from GE Digital. He is our uh, UX guy. Um, it's great to see you all here. Thank you for coming. Uh, feel free to grab more food if you want. And we have the sign-up sheet over there and giveaways in case you didn't uh, get, get any of that. Uh, I also want to introduce Mina Bavali, who is also the other uh, meetup organizer. Yes, there he is. All right. uh, so we'll get started. Uh, first session will be with Matthew McNeely, and then the next session will be with Joe. And, uh, and to Joe, and sorry, to Matthew. So hi everybody, thanks for coming out today. Um, gone are the days of just uh, throwing open your laptop and doing a presentation. That's, that's um, my name is Matthew McGilley, I'm the founder of Nimble Industry. Uh, I'd like to thank you again for coming out. Also thanks to Mina and Mina for organizing this, and also I guess for GE for supplying the pizza and whatever else it costs to put these things on. It's very kind of you. I'd also like to acknowledge two of my founders, who, or two of my advisors rather, who uh, couldn't be here tonight, but they've been very helpful over the last several weeks and months. And also to uh, other people in the Nimble family, Ravi Chandra Siri from uh, Sri Lanka, he's our electrical engineer, and Anna Gallo from Mexico, she's our UX designer. Also a big thank you uh, to uh, Ryan Reed, who was supposed to be here to video this, but he's not, so I strike that from the record. <laughs> If I'm looking at these notes, I apologize. Uh, there's a lot of moving parts in this demo, and I don't have so much time, so I want to make sure I get all the points across. So if you see me glancing down, uh, I, I apologize in advance. So here's the big idea. Um, and I promise not to quit myself ever again in this presentation tonight. But after spending a couple of years in this space, I've arrived at this conclusion. It's not until industrial equipment manufacturers begin embedding IIoT intelligence into their products will the full potential of the industry and the industrial internet be realized. I'm going to try to convince you tonight of the same and prove a hypothesis that I have around this. I'm going to do this by telling a story, a tale of an industrial internet, or I'm sorry, an industrial equipment manufacturer, IEM, I'm going to use that term a lot, IEM and one of their customers. And I tell the story, I'll demonstrate technology that we've developed uh, to help our heroes slay the dragons and grab their own piece of the pot. So here are the players in tonight's fable. Uh, over on the left, we have generic equipment, uh, really great name. They're a medium-sized IEM, and they're in Lake Oregon, Minnesota. They have 150 employees. They make CNC mills, kind of like this, but probably much larger. It's magnificent. And they also make pick and place robots, robots that you pick something up on the line and move it into a box or onto another line. That's their business. And Chip Charles, everyone calls him Charlie's the owner. Uh, I get really deep into these, you know, personas. Uh, <laughs> and he's the owner of GM, who lives in like Mobile Valley as well. Then you've got Zach. Zach's a electrical engineer. He's the guy that's in charge of writing all the software firmware uh, that makes their equipment work, do the things that it does. And then over on the right hand side we have Sherry. She's the owner uh, and uh, GM of a small manufacturing company. They employ 40 people. They produce nameplates and other trim parts for the automotive industry. Very common scenario, not, not unlike uh, what you find out there in the world. And the, the, G Generic has many people like Sherry, some big, some small. Uh, Sherry probably has a relationship with maybe just one or two equipment vendors, and this is the relationship that they have. So, let's say this is, uh, let's say this is one of generics mills, one of their CNC's you can use, I'll make it with, there you go, generics. All right, 
a little button there. You can see that. It says generic on it. That's their logo. They spent millions of dollars on it. <laughs> 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 yeah, right? That's generic to middle. Okay. And uh, it's very simple. It has a very simple firmware board here. Machines controlled by software. Uh, not unlike a lot of machinery in industry now, it, there's a, some sort of control mechanism, CAM. Uh, maybe it's an HMI that's doing uh, controlling, but basically a machine uh, is actually controlling the machine. And sometimes it's a computer, sometimes it's something like a array of PLCs, something like that. But this is the common setup. So uh, CNC would be one example. Uh, another example might be uh, a laser cutter or a robot arm, as I mentioned earlier. So what I'm going to do now is uh, go over to my CNC thing, and let's imagine that we're in the you know, we're in the plant, we're in Sherry's plant, and uh, I'm going to you know, start running some 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 jobs here. Now, my my mill can really let me drive for a minute, so it's, <laughs> typically it's going a lot further, a lot further up and down, and down, and it doesn't really like this table. It needs to, believe it or not, they need to be extremely uh, level, and it's not. But you can get the idea. You can kind of hear it. It's doing something, it's making the world's smallest little thing here. So it's working away. Uh, typically, of course, it'd be a cutter and a spindle in there going around, and I have to get all safety glasses and, and a big mess to clean up, so we won't go there. But you can see, this is uh, going through a cycle right now, on the, let's say on the back of the floor. So everything's great. For decades, IEMs have poured their heart and souls into making equipment like this. Equipment does its job. You know, that's it. It's programmed, uh, and excuse me, one second. And it, you know, it does what it's supposed to do. You know, technology is great, you know, but you might want to watch around your feet because while it was running, there's all sorts of data that just fell onto the floor, here. and it just fell on the back of the floor. It's gone forever. They don't know it yet, these two, or these three, but the industrial internet is about to change the very nature of their business. And it all starts with Sherry. One, week, one weekend she does something, something horrible, and it's about to add a wrinkle to their relationship. What that is, she reads a book. The goal, right? The Bible of Continuous Improvement in Manufacturing. Now, for those of you not familiar, this is a book that's been around for a long time. Here, that's the 20th anniversary, so it's been around, around since the 80s. And a lot of operations managers and factories use this as, a, as the de facto standard for doing what Mr. Goldblatt calls the theory of constraints, which is bottlenecks, how to alleviate the application of these concepts in real life. And that's exactly what Sherry read that week. Of course, to understand bottlenecks, you have to be able to measure equipment, understand when it's running, when it's not running, is the basic, right? And Sherry's determined that a new line since she's been speaking with uh, generic equipment about putting a whole new line in her Kokomo plant that's going to be all generic equipment. But before she does that, she wants to make sure that she's able to monitor the equipment. And I don't have to spell that out for everybody here. That's something called the industrial internet. So it's time to schedule a call with Generic Equipment Corporation. And I have a feeling the call went something like this. And I'll just kind of paraphrase. So, you know, I was like, or, uh, so Sherry's like, hey guys, you know, what makes for a call? I've been reading up on you know, making sure that we can get the ROI we need. And we need to be able to monitor everything. And we need to be able to feedback maybe uh, QA defects into the same line. Uh, and does your equipment have that capability? And then Charlie's like, uh, hi Sherry, uh, oh, I don't know about that. You know, and then he asked that, Zach about ABC manufacturing, another customer of theirs who put a line together last year with monitoring, and Zach's like, yeah, I think they use the XYZ integrators. They had to buy some additional hardware. And then there was the consulting time. Yeah, I think they spent close to $50,000. And she's like, whoa, that's pushing my heart all over the way. Huh? You guys can offer anything? And then those are crickets. Oh, I thought it was cockroaches. <laughs> no, I didn't. No, I didn't search for crickets, so I didn't, I didn't verify the technology. So you know, they had a great relationship for maybe a decade, and now Sherry's wondering if generic equipment is the right company. That's, it's peril, peril for our heroes, they're in trouble. So this is the point where I need to make a clarification. 
So I know it sounds like, you know, I've been uh, picking on IEMs, I've been picking on ZAP, the electrical engineer at the industrial equipment manufacturer. But actually, nothing could be further from the truth. I admire these people, I admire the ZACs of the world. You see, I spent decades writing software, and software whose only manifestation was rendered on an electronic screen or a series of lonely bytes in some sad database in some dark data center. Hey. Right? <laughs> but these guys, right? These guys, you know, they, they manipulate ones and zeros, and they affect that. And I've always been fascinated by that. You know, you, cro you, you close a relay here, you open a valve there, you know, 17 lines of code, and 20 ton press spits out, then that stuff is magical. And this admiration started in my youth. My father worked at General Motors uh, as a tool and die maker. And visiting the plant even 35 years ago, uh, I was amazed at the choreography of the manufacturing line. There was no way that a human was able to put that together. So the hard truth, though, and I've spoken to enough equipment manufacturers to feel comfortable saying this, and I don't know if you'd argue with me, is that they really haven't invested time in understanding how these machines will participate in the industrial internet. And, and ironically, there's no one more qualified than Zach out here in his ilk to influence how a machine should participate in that system. No one more qualified than Zach. No one knows better which control events will affect the machine's efficiency or which sensor readings should be more heavily weighted in a predictive analytics operation. We want to help. That's what we're doing in number. We want to bridge the gap. Our mission is to help IEMs wire up their equipment and so that when it's ready to roll out of the factory, it's ready to satisfy the needs of the industrial internet crowd. So that's what we're trying to do. So back to our story. So these guys at Generic have a decision to make. You know, they're willing to risk losing Sherry's business. That's quite a loss. Well, I bet you know, there's danger around. There's sharks, and who knows what else could be down the line. You know, will they need to, they'll need to make a leap into a frontier that they're not really comfortable in. You know, will they invest the time? We want to help, we want to say yes. We want to make it an easy choice. So this is how we work. We work with generic equipment, we work with IEMs. And the way we work is we get started by going through a checklist. And I'll go a little bit quickly through here because I'm already at 15 minutes and it's getting close. So the, the idea is uh, we look at a machine and the machine interface itself. What uh, technique do we need to actually bridge it with the machine? Um, is it a serial communication device like this one is, where you've got some sort of control device sending you know, two wire or 232 you know, to a controller like this? Or again, like I said, I got a big robot arm or something? Or is it more of a bus architecture like Pokebus, where you know it's more of a subscribe to, to there's a channel? Is that how we're going to get the messages off? We need to know information about the, how the machine operates. Is it cyclical? Uh, is it a constant rate machine like a, like a conveyor belt or is it intermittent like a crane that's only used when needed? What events and alarms in the machine need to be exposed? Uh, an alarm might be a low fluid level, things like that. Things that would already in an event or in a control system to begin with. But we need to then we come out and in that industrial command. Common stop is just kind of reasons. Like, you know, why did the machine stop? They'll know this. Defect alerts on why there were defects, what defects were there, what sensor telemetry and the frequency of that data coming off the machine. For instance, uh, spindle speed or a vibration sensor, uh, maybe a muddling device. Uh, and, and you know, there's another thousand other samples that can be taken from a piece of equipment. Maintenance procedures. Every piece of equipment, even this one, has a certain amount of uh, maintenance must be done, and the manufacturers know this in the intervals in which it must be performed. Uh, and we talk that through as well. We also talk about inbound control, like what do they actually want people to be able to do with ones and zeros for this machine, and. What mobile HMI functionality they might want to have as well. I'll get to that in a minute. So this is a typical plan installation for us. We have uh, a number of nodes that are 
uh, attached, used to attach to a machine. So imagine there's a, a factory with 20 of these machines. There'd be 20 what we call nodes, and, and, the, 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 yeah. and then there's a the one plant gateway. And this gateway is where all that data is activated, and it also runs a web interface. Um, if it's needed, AO211 repeaters are, you know, that are, that are tuned it, it only to our network are put in every 100 meters uh, in the diameter. So we've done all this work now with generic. We know exactly uh, what's supposed to be happening um, with this piece of equipment when it runs in a factory. And, uh, and we have this gateway, which is running a web application. I'm going to switch to that right now. So this is, this is a, a web application that's running on the gateway, and it's access to it you know, from the network is controlled by the company, of course, by whatever they want to do, it's fine. So we log in here, and then we get this, this is, this is mil 10. And this is sort of the interface that we have right here. Now, uh, what I'm going to do is kick off another job, but this time, the uh, equipment, we're gonna, we spent the time, uh, we're, we're, we're now gonna do something really quickly here. Play the demo gods once or twice. <laughs> so now what's happening is our little node, uh, this custom piece of uh, hardware that we have in the factories installed on our machine, ships out of generics, um, generics factory. Now, what we're doing is we're getting in between them. Basically, our, our software sits in between it. I don't want to stop his orders, you know. Um, then this is uh, the first generation. We have another generation um, that Bobby just finished that we're, we're testing right now. It's really good. It's about half the size. This is based on an ARM uh, A7 processor. Um, and the one that we have now is based on Intel Atom. It's a dual core processor. It's about half the size. The whole thing is about half the size of this. And, that Wi-Fi and uh, Bluetooth are integrated into the device, so there's none of this like uh, wobbly bits hanging out, there, which is which is nice, of course. So now, if I set the correct prayers to the demo gods, I will. saying that it'll stop, and there's that at least. And when we run it, yes. <laughs> so now, you know, welcome to the industrial internet. So this CNC now has been wired up. And all the data that we worked with generic to move into our system is being collected and activated on the gateway. So I said the right, I said the exact right prayer. All right, so what I have to do now is switch my network, because there's a little hiccup here in the network, back to District Hall. I want to show you a simulator that we've got running a club, uh, at DigitalOcean. Um, and let's go back here. So this is, this is uh, I, one thing I found over the last year or so uh, in writing industrial internet systems is that really good simulators. Uh, and I've, I've written a simulator, similar, and this is running up on DigitalOcean. What's happening is you've got sort of the same setup. You've got a gateway there, and, uh, and there's also another process on there, just pumping tons of messages into my message bus. So it's simulating that there are a couple of mills and a couple of different place robots at this uh, Acme factory uh, in Copenhagen. So I'm just going to go through this interface really quickly. So you're able to like drill into a mill, looking at this mill now, and we can have a look at the OEE. So the OEE is a combination of these three factors, availability, performance, and quality. Um, we, we're able to see then some of the telemetry coming off the machine. We want to, over here on the left-hand side, we have the events just for that machine that are taking place. Uh, and you know what, we can even check with the machine. Um, what was your OEE? Yesterday. 
any response. So that we developed sort of a conversational relationship in the app that allows uh, the web app as well as the mobile application to actually be actually have a conversation with the, with the machine, which is really kind of cool. Um, the maintenance thing uh, we talked about that earlier. So there's all the intervals that you define um, for this particular machine are listed here, and you can pull up in a manual. And let's say this is like the manual for you know, that machine or how to perform that maintenance. You can clear it, like if you've completed the maintenance, you can clear it, and then it'll start accumulating the time down again based on the runtime. Um, we'll go back up to here. Oh, no, wait, sorry, there's one more thing to look at. Oh, there was, that was it, great. All right. So and I, I mentioned this uh, a little bit earlier. I alluded to it anyway. Um, we're working on a mobile HMI. We have the back end done uh, on the machine. We're just working on the user interface side. It's a tiny bit that jumps here to me. Um, so this is sort of the, uh, the mobile the interface that we proposed would be for a mill like this, for instance. Uh, again, it's the branding of generic equipment. We'll work with whatever I am put their branding on it. We'll even publish the app and put it in both uh, I, the iPhone or the Apple Store and the Android Store. And what's kind of cool about this is that you know we're using Bluetooth to connect to the machine. So I, and I'm walking along and I'm in the factory and you know I might see these three mills come up. And then I, I connect to it, there's a little pin and you have to access a pin to get to it. And then I can see the OE, but this is the only place where it's kind of cool. You can actually control the machine, which the demo is working, but I can stand up to it. And I can actually just drop the machine. Now this is really time saving. Believe me, I, I can tell you my time's like walk over to my computer and then walk back over here, and it's nonstop. So that would be a big time saving. And the same thing in a plant is an HMI to the side. Being able to monitor all the machines around uh, helps to operate be a lot more efficient. And of course, being able to do things like look at the maintenance stuff and actually chat with the machine, and uh, who knows more functionality than taking video or a, 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 a camera or a, a picture of what's happening. So meanwhile, back in Copen, um, you know, our, our heroes were able to deliver. So Sherry's plan is all wired up. Her new, her new line allows her to monitor equipment uh, and its effectiveness and understand where the bottlenecks are in her plan. And she's collecting sensor data, she's combining with events and such and uh, defect reasons and all that business. You know, she's really pleased, she's a really happy customer. But you know, generic has crossed over the line. And generic, our fictional company, they've crossed the line. They've come into the industrial internet. And their products there are more attractive. And there's other things too. When it rains. So everything's back. Uh, you know, back in Lake Wobegon, everything's great. Uh, the heroes are enjoying life with these sales. Sales fixes everything, right? And of course, the children of Lake Wobegon are all about average, so that uh, is great in itself. But another business opportunity has presented itself. This uh, big multinational leasing, equipment leasing company, you know. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> they uh, have uh, uh, approached our friends at Generic and said, hey, listen, we're interested in purchasing outcomes. You know, we don't. And, and we, we want to sell those, we want to lease those outcomes to our customers. So uh, in January, I, I, I forget the speaker's name, but uh, GE had a great line about this where they were trying to sell uh, time on wings as opposed to aircraft engines. Same thing. The economy is moving that way. Uh, they want to purchase raw cycle time on generic CNCs and PNP. And all, all, all that they want, and they don't want to worry about maintenance operation, they want. They want generic to take care of it. Requires new monitoring, new business intelligence. So uh, I, I call them vows. And if you have a better name, I'm, I'm open to any suggestions, and I'll change it immediately. But, so uh, we've seen this architecture on the left already, where our plans are wired up. We have this thing called a vow. And uh, there's, there's a rest interface there that you can pin down as well and allow things in the plant or outside people come in and get the data off of, off of the gateway. We also have these valves, and, and we've written a valve for Amazon Kinesis, and we're working on one for MQTT right now. So what's kind of interesting about this is that with this new architecture, generic equipment is able to send to them, when one of their machines leaves the factory and configures a valve on, a, on their gateway, 
This telemetry and all this control information in the run state data is going out the pipe now and into somewhere. Um, you know, Amazon Kinesis, MQTT, Amazon, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Microsoft's Allure product is just out there, and, and, and GE Credence would be great. Yeah, we could do that, it'd be amazing. Um, what I've done now, though, is Amazon Kinesis went through Amazon Redshift. Redshift is a calmer format uh, data warehouse in Amazon Redshift. It's pretty amazing. You can get terabyte of, uh, you know, terabyte of data you know, for you know, less than $1,000 a year up on that queue. And it's pretty impressive. So, and then on that, there's a ton of things we're going at. We've got Looker, Yellowfin, Tupelo, those are just the ones you might know. There's probably a dozen others that work directly with Redshift. Uh, Amazon even has a run product now, Amazon Machine Learning Service, that allows you to actually take the data from Redshift and then using some graphical interface, like build these machine learning models right up on Amazon Web Services. It's pretty impressive. Um, but the point of this slide, and we'll get to it, is that now, now the data from uh, all these devices that generics <coughs> produce, not just the ones in Kokomo, but like Cherry's plant, but all over the world, are streaming data to some destination. And I didn't really do a great job in my, with my dashboards. You can kind of see the uh, Kinesis fire hose. So this is just a monitoring of all the inbound data right now and what's being sent out to to uh, Redshift. Here's a dashboard at Yellowfin. Um, that doesn't seem to be working, uh, of course. I didn't say a good prayer. Um, here's here's Tableau. Here's one that probably will load. Um, So basically the point here is that you have a lot of these data services now that can take uh, any amount of data that you want to get to it and uh, perform these uh, BI functions like, so for instance, generic equipment is going to need, need to know when the machines are running because they're getting paid that way. It changes the nature of the reporting what they have to do. So, and not, not only is it, do they need that data, they're also getting all this other telemetry. So they're getting all this uh, information uh, about the sensors and run state. The engineers can use that data to uh, you know, look at reason, like they can associate certain failures, possibly with sensor data, correlate that information together. Uh, it helps engineering and product development. Obviously sales and marketing operations could use the data to see when the machines are running out in the field. So this obviously makes sense. So. All right. Okay, so I'm going to put a bow on the story here. So everyone's happy camper by adopting an industrial internet technology to our latest team. You know, change both sharing business and their own in a very fundamental way. Maybe she'll work uh, with generic to retrofit all the other equipment that's in her plant um, with their technology. So, so for generic, they made the equipment more attractive on the marketplace, of course. And uh, they have a whole new revenue stream that wouldn't have been possible without technology like ours and, and many others, of course. So I'm, you know, I'm not saying that the, uh, by the statement here, I'm not saying that you know, the industrial internet's in danger, you know, you know, we're the only one working on the problem. Clearly, you know, we, we're not. But I think that I can make a case, and I've made the case, that if the hundreds of thousands of manufacturers, um, equipment manufacturers around the globe, you know, immediately started adopting technology like I've described tonight. Just, you know, completely changed overnight. That, you know, all the hype around the industrial internet and the promise that it holds industry, I think, would accelerate much faster. And this is the problem that we're trying to solve. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you, everybody. And I, I got the Q&A. There's like a, a you know, right now I'm 30 minutes, so. If anybody has any questions, I'd definitely be happy to ask. Hey, so, um, the data you collect, you put it on gateway first, and 
Well. Right, right. It's stored here um, on the gateway. Uh, we use a time series database called Influx PD. Uh, yes. So there's a time interval before it collects the map of data and then it sends the bunch to the cloud and then it starts again? Yeah, exactly. That's, that's configurable you know, in these valves. These valves, you, know, you, can, you can change the parameters, you can change which metrics, frequency, should it be aggregated, you know, like should you roll it up maybe for a day and then fire it off or for an hour or whatever? Okay. You can change all those characteristics. So if you're not, not doing the cloud, you're saying one manufacturing uh, uh, plant, mm -hmm. you're just using the gateway. What's the um, amount of data you can collect? Yeah, I mean, this, this, I can, this I can see here that we have, maybe it's an ACES brand, it's just right off the shelf, it's like 250 bucks. You know, it's got, it's got, I think it's a 20 gigabyte solid state hard drive. Obviously, in a, in a larger setting, more machines, we need more capacity. You could also have a valve over in QGP maybe to a, uh, a historian, you know, data story. In fact, we do this a lot. This is big, you know, things in the corner that just don't a lot of data. You could, you could do that technology as well. The, 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 the thing is, is it's really quite flexible. Yeah, I guess my question is, for example, if I'm only uh, using the gateway uh, and I'm collecting all the data, let's say in a year, the capacity of the reach. Do you have like a purging mechanism that will purge last year's data and only do this year's data? Uh, I, I, it's, it's not built in right, right now, but there is a technique available on uh, InfluxDB that will do that. There's retention okay. policies. So I can set a uh, retention policy for one area of measurements to be 30 days, and then uh, and then, then choose to roll up an aggregate into another retention policy. I, I just have to measure it. You can be that good. So, um, could you please explain what kind of uh, sensors were, were required to be mounted, what kind of data are you collecting, and why could this could not have been done instead of your solution in the Profibus and that environment? Right. It, it totally can be done in the pro Profibus. And, and, and that's exactly what we'd be doing. So, this is one scenario where we're getting in, in between serial communications. So, like, for instance, you know, that program that I was using, it. Um, you know, it, it, it sends G code to uh, this GDR, GDRVL controller on this firmware board. Uh, robot arms is a very similar technique. It sends basically serial data back and forth, control data back and forth. That's one technique. The other technique is what well, you mentioned, like Profi Bus or Profi Net, where it's a hub architecture. That's even easier. I mean, we had to do some hoops to make this work. We just kind of plug into that, and, we, and like kind of like in the old PLC days, you just read a register. And then, then, and then we get that data, format it, and then move it out. So I'm not, yeah, I'm not saying that you couldn't deal with other solutions. This is a solution that we think is appropriate for IAMs because right now, if, if an IAM is even, you know, so the, that's a control network. So let's say there's two of these and a control arm, like a robot arm and an overhead thing, you know, works in it. Typically, you would use a control network like ProfiNet, right? And those are all coordinated together. They would control maybe the, the speed of the conveyor or head or whatever. But the problem is, is that that's where it stops. Those manufacturers, those equipment manufacturers, people who built that system, don't think, oh, you know, maybe we should you know, be able to see how often it's running. They don't think that far. Right? They, they, this, that's not their problem, so they don't solve it. Right? We only solve really the problems that are assigned to us. I saw this firsthand at a plant in Taiwan where you, know, you had these $50,000 robot arms being installed on the line and no one knew when they were running and they weren't running. Extremely sophisticated software was controlling the robot arm so that it wouldn't strike someone in the head. It's like, it's amazing. But they had to wire up a PLC, you know, and like, and, and, and it missed the point. There's so much data on that robot arm that's not getting out. What we want to do is work with IEMs to make sure that, that those engineers that build that equipment know exactly what data should be coming on and we'll help them get it off. Is your solution scalable? So let's say Sherry's plant doubles in size. Right. Do you want to do also work on making it scalable for her? Yeah, you know, the, I mean, the truth of it is, is that we'll have to work with integrators. Integrators will have to come in the picture at some point. So this, I mean, from the people I've spoken to, about 75% of equipment manufacturers just kind of like give it off to integrators. And they're the ones that go into the factory and build them up. Um, so at the end of the day, if there's you know, a plant with 4,000 nodes, like things like this that are wired up, then there's going to have to be a lot more data. There's going to have to be a lot more 
you know, Wi-Fi repeaters, it's going to have to be larger hardware, things like that. Uh, but yeah, I think it'll scale. I mean, I, I, I scaled it uh, on my on my simulator. You know, I've got you know, a half gigabyte of data collected over three months up there, and it's on a very small machine. It's performing, it's still performing today. It's the same system we used to use. So I think it'll scale. Scaling up, but also how about scaling horizontally with more feature functions. Uh, are you capable of doing that, sir? More feature functions? Yeah, like so let's say today she's making devices, the slicing right. plates, and right. tomorrow she's making chassis or something. So you want to still have that control, but maybe you've added another complexity to the manufacturer. Totally. And, and typically, that's, that's how IoT installations are kind of tackled right now. People get the machines in. They put a line together, like, hey, I got an idea. Let's do some industrial internet stuff with this, right? My advice is just the opposite. It's like, when it comes to you, it's going to be ready to participate. So if she buys a license plate stamp or whatever, yeah. when she gets that equipment, it's going to be, it's going to already be ready to roll in her, in her already industrialized, industrial internet capable plant. You see what I'm saying? It's not like an afterthought. It's like, when it leaves generic equipment's manufacturing facility, it's already a rock. And that's a big difference. That's sort of, you know, my the big idea I've tried to get across. Maybe I didn't do a very good job of it. But that's the idea. It's like right now, a lot of IoT is an afterthought. I'm going to make it before that. Right? This is the yeah. I think you really hit on it with these the the people manufacturing the products are not necessarily they don't know what good this could bring to them. How do you? How do you present that, like in an ROI, like a business case, to say, you know, you're going to spend this much money investing in something, and you're going to have all this data, and hopefully you can do something with all this data, something great. Are there like any great case studies to show that, you know, a lot of times if you're collecting machine spindle speed or, or vibration data off the machine, you can, you know, your preventative maintenance gets a, a lot better. Like, I, the same thing I saw is yeah. it's hard to sell this because there's up, I don't know what the upfront costs of it are, but they're, they're, there's something there. Of course, yeah, there's no free lunch. Um, and th there are a lot of articles I've been reading a lot. I, I can't cite one specific article to tell you that, yeah, you got to do it. You know, but um, even if you get one or 2% efficiency gain out of the system, it's, a, it's an impressive gain. Um, I'm certain you know, that you can do a lot better um, than just those small numbers. Um, I have a question for you though. You said, you know, what, what, what's the argument you make? How do you convince somebody? Is it Sherry, you know, that you're convincing? Right, or is it or, or is it the other yeah. manufacturer? It's, I can, I, 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 I don't know the answer to that. Um, I'll be quite upfront. You know the answer to this? Continue on now, come back to me. All right, cool. I, I don't know the answer to that, but I, 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 the conversation that I've had with manufacturers now is that, but they kind of get it, they kind of get it, like, yeah, yeah, we've had in that scenario about XYZ integrators or whatever, that, that was kind of real, like, that happened to somebody. And I'm like, why can't your stuff do this? So, you know, for me, this to be able to go to equipment manufacturer and say, listen, you know, to license our technology, you put on your machine for, you know, $700 a machine that rolls out of the factory, um, it makes your machine more attractive. It makes it more competitive. And it, it's, it's a potential of opening up a whole new revenue stream for you, much like, a lot of these big companies are doing right now. So that's the argument I've been making. I haven't argued the case to Sherry uh, why she should spend a little more on a machine that's you know, cool. And right, more on the machine and then more on potential infrastructure in the possibly, plant, like you mentioned, possibly. to swap over their systems to start working with this. Right. Well, well the way we're planning it, though, she wouldn't have to buy anything else. And she could get all this. And if she just has her browser, she could point at that gateway and see things. She wouldn't have to buy anything else. I mean, if it's a small enough. I think it's really interesting your point about the leasing outcomes. Yes. Two, two things about that, leasing and outcome. So if you're, if you're gonna buy a piece of capital equipment, it's a huge capex expense. So if you can change the way you sell that machine to be a opex, that, that machine's purpose is to produce a good part. So if you can, you can lease that expense as, as in so many good parts and charge for that rather than charging for the capex of the whole machine. Um, back in the early 90s, my own personal story, I was with Hewlett Packard selling manufacturing test systems. 
board testers, bedded nails, in circuit testers. These are a quarter of a million dollar pieces of equipment. Very expensive. Manufacturing is very tough to have budget. And we figured out a way to sell per test. And you would load a pill into the machine, into the board test. It was a memory module, and it had so many executions. Wow. Maybe, maybe we were ahead of our time or, or whatever. Uh, but it, it lowered the cost of lowered the cost of acquisition by a factor of about 10. But the customer wasn't ready for that. They, they, they didn't trust. They, they thought that, that they would run out of pills and have to be buying more and more pills. But that's what the data gives you. It gives you the confidence to trust a new selling model. So if there's a way to put sensors on this equipment to predict how many, to predict the good put of the machine, you can change the business model and sell a lot more machines. Yeah. I, I have to admit, I wasn't my brilliant idea. It's VML, VML, big multinational equipment which is some came to us. Some came to us, and the names didn't change, but you know, But with this very idea, and and they approached us because they they needed a reliable way to understand when the machines are running. And of course, uh, the equipment manufacturers were like, hey, "This is great." You know, when you get this telemetry and start using it to guide our businesses or product decisions. And uh, so, yeah, it, it's a game changer. It's, it could be the game changer. Yeah, in fact, that is the model in IoT as I understand it. It's going to be based on a subscription basis as opposed to actually selling the cap. Mm -hmm. Right? And I think even GE is say, saying that. I don't mean to speak for them, but I mean, I read their reports. They're talking about jet engines as a service, right? They're not selling you the commodity called jet engines. They're selling everything, the tech refresh, the maintenance, right. contract, yeah, the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I've mentioned this, but I may have missed it. So on the, on the edge machines, uh, is there a way to like run some basic analytics to understand uh, anything <coughs> from the data that is coming? Uh, with the amount of data that is coming, that is flowing in, can can any analytics run there on the edge? Before yeah, you can right on the machine at level. Right. Level? Right. Yes, you can. I mean, that's it's an idea that one of my advisors has given me as well. And um, you know, there with this new architecture, this new uh, Intel Atom architecture, it's it's really quick. I'm really surprised how fast it is. And you could move some analysis. I'm not certain that you know you want to run. You know, deep learning and anything like that on it, but you could do a lot more. I mean, it's it basically it's running an operating system. It's a custom version of Ubuntu that we've got going on both these systems, a little bit different flavors, but so it's running a full-fledged operating system. So yeah, you could do quite a lot of things on it. So what do you need to address security? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, so this this device is connecting into a WPA2 secure Wi-Fi network. So this this uh, gateway here, this little guy here, which is represented by that guy back there, uh, in the middle, it's creating a subnetwork of its own, and it's WP2A secure. And the nodes only know that to get home to this guy. There's no way for that node to go anywhere else. He only knows the phone home here. Um, on, on the, on here, then we're just using you know, your typical you know, uh, TLS or you know what other uh, SSL encryption techniques on the on the valve area. So you know, everyone has got their own flavor. You can connect to you know, different kinds of uh, key systems and security requirements. We try to adapt to all. And right now, it's it's going wide open. You can use if anyone's to, like hacking in my Kinesis fire screen. In my fire hose, you can see all the simulated sensor data. I'm mean, very excited. We can do it right now. One day I'll be done. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks.
All right, so I am a creative director. And what is that in, this, in the sense of this? Well, basically, I am focused on the front end user interface design for what you guys are producing and getting that and filtering that to the appropriate users. So what I wanted to talk about a little bit, so this is going to be a little far afield of the technology conversation, but it is how all this stuff gets glued together and presented. So I look at the, internet, the industrial internet of things a little bit differently um, than folks like data management, for instance. It's, it's all about aggregated data, obviously, but it's through a certain prism of UX. So what I usually do is I take a look and I say, okay, it's, it's the industrial internet of things. But what are things? Things are nouns. So essentially, you have to look at this from the perspective of what are you actually managing? When it comes down to talking to that business person and selling them the idea, like the conversation you were just having, how do you prove to them that it actually is going to improve their environment or make them more efficient? What's the percentage of payback? So you take a look at that, and when I say people think people, places, and things, I think customers and users. I think facilities, and I think assets. And all those things are managed from a data perspective. If something doesn't relate to that, then it's not the Internet of Things anymore. I'd also like to point out that the Internet we had yesterday, before we called it the Internet of Things, or the Industrial Internet of Things, was an Internet of Things. And you could basically go into Google or any search engine, type in something, and you could find all the things in the world. But the point is, you don't just want to find things. You want to find things that are related to verbs. You want them to do something. If you don't have, if you just give them things, we're, we all go home. Google has figured that out. What we really need to do is you need to streamline the process and aggregate information and maximize efficiency. That's the payoff. That's going to make them buy. Um, I actually just had an experience with Google. I think Google is, is starting to do that. Actually, I was shopping for something online, which happens a lot, <laughs> to my wife's chagrin. Um, and, and, the, and the reality is, you know, I went in and I typed something and I hit shop in Google and I expected to get all comparison prices. And then, lo and behold, they started to put up a store based on all my previous searches, which was pleasing and disturbing at the same time. <laughs> so, but, but essentially, when you're talking to UX folks and you go, what are these guys talking about? It's essentially this. We're really driven by what are they going to do with this stuff? What's going to make sense to them? And if it doesn't make sense to them, then it may not be worth it. So I just want to give you an, an early example. I'm not sure how many folks are familiar with uh, Edward Tufte. Uh, he is a professor and has written several books about uh, the display of information and the quantitative display of information. He has a great example of the first time someone tried to really aggregate data in a meaningful way, and certainly not in their industry. So in 1854, uh, there was a cholera outbreak in London. Dr. John Snow, and for those of Game of Thrones fans, it is not that John Snow. <laughs> He's dead, maybe. Um, but essentially what John Snow did, he did something extremely clever and something that you wouldn't expect a doctor to do. He basically knew from science that people get cholera from water. And, there, and so he basically took a map of the region that was infected and all his patients, and he basically put those blue X's on the screen and said, okay, I'll put those on the map and then I'll plot out how many people got sick. Well, this is what he discovered. He basically saw that there was a cluster right in the center of the township, and then there were a couple clusters here, and there were a couple clusters there, and he was surprised that those, those were there. He found out those pumps were broken. So they all went to the center when they did their shopping. They shut off that pump, a month later, no more outbreaks. Now what we're doing on the industrial internet is that on a mega scale. You take a thousand of those maps and you overlay them on, on themselves, that's what we're doing. But, we're, but the important part is, you've got to get that pump data. We always talk about pumps, so I thought it was kind of ironic. But you've got to get that pump data to the right person. It doesn't matter if you deliver it to the CEO of a company who's running a manufacturing firm. He doesn't care that a pump's broken. But I can tell you a line manager sure is <laughs> if he's part of the water treatment plant. So, this is, a, this is an early depiction of that, but this is, again, how we kind of approach the data side so from the other side of it. I wanted to show you, you know, who are we designing for? So a lot of people talk about process 
and uh, real time <coughs> process, and I won't bore you with it. I'll, I'll try to keep it as fun as possible. But, but the reality is, the first thing you have to start with, whether you have a process or not, if you just got out of school and you're trying to figure it out, you have to consider who you're designing for. After that point, if you don't consider that, whatever process you follow doesn't matter. Because it's all studying communications and people are actually doing something with that data. So you identify your user types, you develop profiles or persona of those user types, and then basically you tell a story, which is very much what Matthew was doing. He was telling a story. And that's very relevant because that makes it tangible to people. And one of the reasons why it's important to make it tangible to people is, this is something that I've found through my career. Essentially, you have people that are on the business side. They're the customers. They're the ones with the, the green to give you what you're doing. But more times than not, they're not your user. Their users are their constituency. So they're operations. They're the operators the line managers, the analysts, all those folks. And, and there's a sliding scale. So it essentially goes from the, the CXO level down to the individual operator on a machine. And then there are multi-different levels of uh, strata where they want to reference different data. But where you have a situation where the customers take a look at something and say, these are our world of problems. And then you take a look at the operators and the operations people, and they say, this is my world of problems. There's inevitably an overlap. In terms of satisfying your customers, work on that overlap part. Because a lot of this, and I think most folks who have dealt with the industry, for instance, if you do a lot of the stuff that the management team wants, a lot of the times the operators won't do it because they feel like big brother is possible. So even if you design the interface and do that, that portion of it, they go, well, you know, the man is looking at what I'm trying to do. Versus, if they can make me a lot more efficient, I can go home early. Because that's what they're really thinking. <laughs> These guys are thinking, if I could just make those guys more efficient so we can actually put out more product. So you take that overlap and you figure out how to do that. That's, that's the UX part of what we're trying to do. To kind of give you an overview of how you might want to think about the impressions to these people, we have this thing called the CX footprint. So all of the blue area is the customer experience, the whole map. Customer experience is what you promise your customers. So you go to them and you say, I'll give you a great example. I used to work uh, with a large telephony company, with three letters and an amber sand of them. Um, and, and they promised from a marketing and branding degree, if you, if you think about it, that they promised that they had the best quality telephone service. They didn't say they were cheaper. They didn't care if they charged through the nose. But you picked up that phone, and it worked. And so that's what they promised to do. Now, that means that some of your decisions when you make a brand promise about what you're doing, and you're doing a customer experience, you're basically going to promise some things, and therefore you can automatically, automatically eliminate things off your plate, because you're not going to promise others. There's always a reciprocal reaction. The UX, which everybody talks about, quite frankly, in very generic terms, is the experience you give them. This is not the computer user interface. I just want to point that out. This is actually the touch points your customers have with your business. So it's the call center, it's your salespeople, it's your business card, it's your locations, it is how you interact with some of the public facing software, sure, but it's, it's not the whole thing. And then UI itself, that's where everybody in this room lives. We live in the UI. The output of what we do is going to be in the UI most likely. At some point, it's either going to touch something, a person that, that actually goes and reaches out to the customer, or it's going to be the customer themselves, of, of our customers. So what we take a look at is, Making sure that that promise, and this really helps from a business perspective too, because if you figure out what your promise is, then you can figure out what you're going to say no to, honestly. And that's important in this environment, because the Internet of Things is pretty big. It would be good to narrow down and figure out what targeted slice you're going to go after, and then, you know, go for it. You then make sure that every touch point you have with your customers is in line with that, and then finally, you make sure that the interfaces that you're putting together 
are appropriate to drive to that, those ends. So I just wanted to point out, I put these two symbols up here. The first one was on the previous, they both were on the previous slide. But the two people, those are the business people. The business people live in, in the UX land and can bleed into CX and, and go into UI. Your operators probably never heard of what your customer promise is. <laughs> they're much more concerned about how many rubber duckies they're going to make in a day, or how many tires, or how many band-aids. So their experience is, did this make my life easier? Did this make me more efficient? Did this make us hit our goals online? That kind of stuff. It's very tactical stuff, but it's extremely important. And it was interesting, Matt brought this up, and, and there's, a, there's an issue almost of digital trust that's involved. And what I mean by digital trust is this, that when you provide one number to someone and you roll up and aggregate all this data and you say, you are 98% right, and the person looks at it and goes, I, I, you know, I was used to seeing the Excel spreadsheet with all the data that was live fed into it, and I could see that all the data was working, so then I could see the calculation at the bottom, and then I believed it was 98%. We do have a bit of maturity to go to make people understand the weight behind that number so we don't have to show them a thousand numbers in order to believe that, that 98% is true. Um, so that's, for instance, why when you were talking about dropping a pill <laughs> into a system and them not believing it, that's, that's why, because the digital trust wasn't there. It was like, uh, this feels a little too much like magic. So then from there, it's what's the approach for this? And what we do is, we do an approach called design thinking. Now one thing, I, I, the reason why I asked you guys where you hail from, so to speak, is I, I do visual design. I'm trained as a visual designer and a UI designer. I've expanded into inter, interactive design and obviously conceptual design and all that. But that, that's been kind of my career path. I don't expect you people all of a sudden because you saw a slide presentation and you go read a book that all of a sudden you're designers. What we mean by design thinking is this, you got to think about the fact that no matter how much you work on that database and you hone those fields and make sure that they calculate the right algorithms and it all spits out, if the UI design cannot present that in a way that the end user can understand it, it's all for naught. It's like the tree that fell in the forest and nobody heard it because they were there. So it doesn't really matter if it really fell or not. <laughs> and so, it's that general concept that just keep that in mind as you do what you do. No one's asking you to do something different. It's just adding to the repertoire of how you think about these things so you go, hmm, I'm throwing this number together. I've just worked a week and a half on it. We've, we've had like five scrums on this. And then all of a sudden, you know, what are you going to use this number for again? It's asking that question and finding out that there is actually a reasonable answer to that. Uh, but design thinking is about thinking through the problem in a creative way, seeing if you can solve it another way. Um, and that's really important. From there, we talk about the, the various different processes. So I told you we get processes. I kept it to two slides, I promise. But design thinking is what we just talked about. So everything before this dash line, it's, it's really the customer problem and the customer issue, or if you want to be positive, the customer challenge. Um, and essentially what you're trying to do is you're really in that identify phase. You're trying to identify what's wrong, what's happening, who's engaged in the process, who should be engaged in the process. And when you figure out all that stuff, so basically build your requirements. You come through and you go, okay, I'm gonna do a lean startup thing. So I'm gonna do a fast prototype. It might be in paper, it might be on a whiteboard during a meeting, it could be various levels, it could be interact. But the reality is you start to think about the prototype and you run it by people who know this. You run it by the users, and if you don't have access to users, then you look for people who have worked in that environment before, or maybe work for your current company. But any input is better than none in terms of, of vetting something. Then you go to the point where you're going, okay, I'm going to start to do something, but how do I have to get this done and get this into actually release product? And everybody knows Agile. One thing I wanted to point out specifically, because I had you guys trapped in the room, <laughs> is that when you get to that point where you feel like you can persevere, and you're going down that path, and you're iterating, I think all of you guys will agree with this. You have to make sure that when the business is doing this, that iteration does not mean that those circles 
right there stay at the same size. Meaning, I iterated, oh, you know what, we came up with a new idea, and you iterate again, and the circle's the same size, and you've just spent the same money. You would be better off telling them, you know what, we shouldn't have started. You're still here. You shouldn't have persevered. You should have pivoted. And then you can come back and do this. But the circle should get smaller. You are going to iterate. You are going to figure out, out something. But the basis of what you're your basically, your hypothesis shouldn't change so much that it's going to be a complete rewrite to do it. So, that is my soapbox. I'll, I'll get on there. I was two inches tall. So, I just wanted to show you what, what Predix does, what GE G is doing. Um, and essentially, it's, it's, we look at it this way. So, I talked about the CX and just tying this back to what we originally talked about. But, you have the CX concept. You have custom versus modularity. So relating this back directly to the industrial internet, what we did previously when we were designing websites and web applications and financial apps and, there was a, and healthcare apps, they were very honed. They were very specific. They were kind of like this car. You know, that side view mirror isn't going on any other car. That wheel isn't going to go on any other car. That tail light isn't. It's going to be a bug is a bug is a bug. So we design those things. The, the flaw in the ointment of that is for the Internet of Things, you would have to design these separate units all the time that are not interchangeable. So how do you deal with that? You make it more modular. So maybe you make something like this. You make individual bricks that are pieces of functionality that can be shared, and you can snap them together and then you can configure them in different ways. So how does that help you? Well, you have your car, but then you can use parts of that car to make all different kinds of cars for all different kinds of reasons. And that's, that's a big deal to the Internet of Things. Because I don't think many people look at it that way. They look at, oh, we're going to aggregate this data and solve it for this customer. We can't do that. We'll never get there. It'll be 2050 <laughs> before we have a viable system. What you actually have to do is make a certain sacrifice in fidelity. So in other words, when I made that change, you were looking at a smooth car designed by Dr. Porsche, and then all of a sudden now I'm doing a Lego. So there's going to be rough edges in terms of how things match together, but you are allowing your users to configure their own environment. So you don't have the problem of quote unquote taking the blame that why can't I take this golden batch from making my rubber ducks and compare it to last year's golden batch because I have the data, but I can't get it from the old system. But oh, wait a minute, with the Internet of Things, I can put those on the same screen. So essentially, you have those building blocks, pun intended. From there, what's, what's the actual process? So I just wanted to give you, I, I blocked out the descriptions to protect the innocent. But essentially, we look at those UX personas. So like those cars that previously translated, each person's probably going to drive a slightly different car because they're a different person. So you do some interviews. And if you're the developers, you don't have to do the interviews, but you probably should ask maybe, hey, I'm designing this feature. Who am I designing it for? What, what is it solving? Because there's, there's a certain humanity to this that at the end of the day, it was kind of funny. Someone said, oh, do you think the industrial internet will you know, take away the ability of human beings to do any of this and it'll all be automated. And I said, well, it's not all going to be automated. It'll, what's being, what, they, what people will do will be different when automation comes in, but they'll be doing something different. Maybe it'll be fewer people doing for that particular task, but it's still going to be there. And this, so there's a certain logic and flow that people believe in as they go through a process. So you define the various different roles in the system. And one thing I would stress is there is a psychology, and it's, it's everywhere. It's pervasive. It was even back when the, when the websites were big things, that, you know, <laughs> people have a tendency to think that people, uh, that their users and their customers are going to live in their application. If we do that, it's a failure. They're only going to use, I hope, users on a mercury thermometer are paying a heck of a lot more attention to the mercury going into the thermometer than they are in my computer screen telling them how much they produced. So, it's going to be an intermittent thing, and that's, that's a UI experience you have to actually track because if it's an intermittent thing, then it has to be an interface that's easy to remember because they might only look at it every hour or every two hours or every two days. The old example is TurboTax. People said, 
I love TurboTax, and one of the things that's great about TurboTax is you can easily make the decision that it was going to be something someone was going to walk through a wizard, essentially, and you didn't have to worry about, oh, we're going to get experienced users, and then they're going to be on board, because you do it once a year. So since you do it once a year, you can afford to explain it to them every single time. When you're designing a really complex app for like financial banking, for instance, just to pull something from somewhere else, those people, you have to, you have to figure out a scheme of how you're going to ramp them up into it, and then they're going to live in your app all day. So then, you've, then you have a different psychology. You've got to make sure that they actually embrace and accept the fact that they're learning the tricks of the trade, and then they start using it like an application, like people do with Excel, where they just know it inside out because they know it inside out. From there, what do we do? We get to a point where we get to that sketch phase, that prototyping phase I was talking about. So essentially what we do is we take a look at these different folks and we say, okay, what screens are going to cover what people literally? And then we write a story. It's very important to tell a story because for your, from your project management team all the way down to your developers, everybody understands a story and they can also do a certain amount of a sniff test and basically say, okay, this, this had never happened. I mean, I've read stories where they go, and Julie was happy. <laughs> it's like, Julie's never really going to be happy. You know, about the application. She's going to be satisfied with the fact that it did what it needed to do, and she can go on to the next thing. And you want to be realistic about that. So from there, I only have two slides left. <laughs> from there, I just wanted to point out some of the stuff that we have done with Greetings. So we've done analysis software, we've done alarming, We've done communications, we've done some fleet stuff, fleet on a map, we've done some batch processes things, and we've done some actual step through operations for the operator. But all of these are contained within the same interface. And I kind of go back to the idea of, of a prism. If you think of it like a prism where you're taking light and you're bending it and you're focusing it on one particular point and you can turn it and bend it and project it somewhere else, that's what we need to do with the industrial engine. We have to be able to focus at the right points for the right customers. Um, and from that perspective, you know, it has to be the advantage of the industrial internet is getting unforeseen results from the aggregated data that's there. The, it's, it's great to have someone say, oh, I have an idea we can compare this, but when they can see things that weren't aligned, I'll give you an example, one, one final story. I was in a factory where they had cardboard as one of their pieces to what they were building. And they were having this problem, and, and we had uh, installed all our software, done all this thing, and they were, they were rolls of cardboard, and they were cutting them, and they were actually crunching, and in some cases, shattering the cardboard. What is going on? And so they, they went through, and they said, this is really, really strange. So I said, okay, we're going to actually put someone on this and lock down the area and figure out why we're losing all this material. So. Eventually, they put in a new security system that happened to be tied into their, the, the rest of their systems. And they noticed that the humidity in that portion of the building was fluctuating during the summer months. And then they realized that the guys that were online, when they got their break, they'd go out for 15 minutes and prop the door open for their smoke break. And it allowed all the heat, the George heat, to come in, flood all the cardboard with with water, then they'd shut the door, the air conditioners would run out of light, it would completely dry out, and that's why it was having a problem. But they figured that out after about a year and a half. The industrial internet should be able to make that contrast and say, I'm having an issue. I mean, this is way future, but nonetheless, this is the direction. I'm having this problem where my cardboard is going bad in sector one. Well, it's going bad because the door is left open. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what it should come back with because there's enough information to aggregate and it doesn't seem to be related, but it actually is. And so that's the value, but I guess my point is from a UX and UI designer, I also think of it in terms of interface. I know that we are not the, people, the last people, meaning the designers are not going to be the last people and the developers actually aren't going to be the last people to touch our applications if they're successful. It's going to be our users and our customers who will configure it to whatever their needs are because we're not going to design one thing for building ships and then apply that to building you know, small toy models. It's just not going to be the same thing. So they're going to basically reconfigure the software. If we can give them a tool that allows them to do that without heinously screwing up, <laughs> then we've succeeded because we've allowed them to make the comparisons and contrasts they wanted to make 
and without the fear of actually that, that digital trust, without that fear of it all falling apart on them because they did something bad. Which are, no one wants to do anything bad and they freeze and they don't do anything at all. Which is the worst part. But in any case, folks, I'm at that point, that question part of the day. Anybody have any questions for me? Hey, Joe. Hey there. <clears throat> Thanks for sharing. Uh, were, were those all interfaces from Freedix that, that were up there on the screen? They they are on the roadmap. Yes. And are you guys? Does your team work with any other? Maybe the better question is: Is there any other units at GE building software like that? Or like yes, this? there are. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There's there's various different. We we are converging, so that the solution is a common solve across. There's right. no question of that. In terms of the design system, it is all very similar now. So when you see a GE app, you'll know it's a GE app. There's no question about that. And uh, do you use uh, any any uh, framework, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, not Bootstrap, but something similar like a flat? Yeah. Google um, Prism or whatever. Well, there, there's there's multiple um, front ends that we've used. We've used uh, Angular. We're mostly trying to base everything so it spits out at the end of the day it's going to be HTML. Because we right. want it to be relatively agnostic, sure. um, but it's I've heard uh, that's the most prominent with our team is Angular. I know that we've also used Polymer. Um, yeah, Google Polymer. That's the one I was thinking. Yeah, uh, Google Polymer. But but at the end of the day, it all has to marry up because because GE is as uh, Mina I think said Mina to the left <laughs> said there there are twenty four thousand people in GE Digital. The, but the scarier number is there are 350,000 people in GE, all with independent wants and needs. So it's never going to be managed at the point of, you know, I, I know that there's a lot of discussion about a central um, design system, and there definitely will be, but there will always be new identified uses, and that will con constantly be organic, and that's an expectation. Sure. Are you looking at augmented reality in your user experience? Oh, yes. Yeah, it's a lot more complex though because from the modularity perspective, it gets a little more difficult because then you'd have to have the hardware and the devices to actually scan in those environments in order to replicate them. So it becomes very machine specific or install specific. Like I've certainly seen examples where people wire a car door or something like that. It's very specific to that year's car. So they're wiring the Ford Mustang and putting in that stuff. So those I think as those industries mature, we're definitely going to integrate that stuff. I think that it's it's at a higher level, and it also depends on how long it takes to make a product. So, for instance, it's a it's a no brainer in aviation, for instance, because we're going to be making those engines for a long time. Um, versus, you know, something where you're building a car and it can change by the year, that may be a little more difficult to document. And that's not so much that we can't make it; it's that it would rely on our customers to then customize it enough to use it for their situation. Um, as part of your prototyping phase, how do you get input to know if the UI is working or not? Do you do like, usability testing? Do you go out and talk to customers? How do you, uh, it's, it's very interesting. I've been, I've been doing this for a while, and usually it's very, very hard to get access to end users. In GE, for some anomaly, we don't have that problem. They are very, very eager to talk to us, which is, I have to admit, is unusual. I say that kind of gloating a little bit, but it, it's, it, it really is interesting to have the engagement level that we have. So all of the above. We've done, we, we have had situations where there was something really quick. So we really use the, the customer sponsor to you know, review things and send it through them, which isn't quite as reliable, but it is helpful. Uh, we do have um, basically key Lighthouse customer calls where we actually engage the customers and make sure that they see our interfaces and then deliver that through just as a normal course of, of doing business. So that's not for any particular reason, but we tell them, hey, we, got, we just figure out a new import routine that's more automatic or we can do it through a barcode. How will this work in your environment? And then we do do contextual interviews. So I've done those myself where you actually go to the plant you sit down and you really talk to old man Jensen, as we joke about, you know, the guy who goes, I'm never going to use this stuff. <laughs> you know, and you really talk to him and go, what would make your life better? Well, if I could do these three things, that would help. And th that's gold. Because when you get that, you can translate that out and extrapolate that out to a lot of other issues. So that's 
So it's all debug. Anybody else? Can you take it? Nothing? Oh. So how long have you worked with GE? I've been with GE for four years. I, uh, I actually started as an interactive designer way back when, believe it or not, at Channel 2 in Boston. And I did educational software oh. from there. Myriad of different things, but I, I, I was at one point the technical director of animation for where the world was come and see the Diego TV show. <laughs> um, that was really fun. But but graduated all the way through to, to GE because I got really interested in application design. Uh, I realized that everything was going towards applications, even when people didn't realize that they were going to turn. Yes, sir. When you were talking about um, user configurability or customer configurability, where do you draw the line between what is configurable versus what's complex? And the more configurability you have, the kind of part of it is to use. How do you view that? I think you have to deal with it. At, I, I always think of this, and I harken back to kind of the molecular level, you know, up through the, the, the powers of 10, so to speak. What zoom level you need to deal with for a particular customer. So, I think that when it comes to giving them what I would call molecular based components to an interface that everyone can use, you really have to boil it down pretty small. So you basically have to say fields are treated this way, all the rules of the fields come with it when it has an error message, this is the way it's dealt with, all those pieces. It can go into graphing and charting and things like that and giving them selectability of saying, okay, I can import all the data I want and we can basically say, there's a range there, but what we basically do is start to remove options when it's logical that you couldn't do, like for instance, a pie chart with one million things. So all of a sudden, the pie chart falls off and it becomes a scatter block diagram, it becomes a heat map, that kind of thing. So you have to do a lot of internal intelligence in order to do that. I do think that what you have to do is stay fluid enough and flexible enough with the design that you can accommodate unforeseen relationships that may be drawn. And, and that's why I said the coarseness is kind of there on the interface, because some things may not always work the way you want them to from a programming standpoint. So for instance, let's say you had the information over here and you changed something here. There's no question if it had an effect on the thing that's over here that it should change, but these two things aren't talking to each other. They're talking to a central data point in order to do it. That's where I get technical. <laughs> but, but it has to work that way, because if you make it so married and you start doing you know, the Volkswagen view, the real Volkswagen view, and you really make sure that everything's so tied together, then at the point you take, you want to make sure the rule of the game is if I pull that out, this isn't going to break. Because that's, that's what's going to happen. And the thing is that the reciprocal argument for a customer, for instance, or a discussion that you'll have with a customer is they'll say, oh, I, I want, you know, infinite customizable stuff. And then you go, okay, well, five years from now when you want to upgrade, do you want to be able to upgrade? What's the cost value for you having that, that bell and whistle versus being able to just go to the internet, hit a button, have it downloaded, and completely updated? And the analogy I give is there's uh, basically two applications. If you're a visual designer like me, there's two applications you basically download. You download Creative Cloud and Microsoft. And if the government heard that, they, they should probably know that there's a monopoly there. <laughs> because there's, there's no other applications in reality to really use. But, but the reason why I bring that up is nobody goes into their Microsoft Word and says, I'm going to rearrange the menu. Because I want save to the right hand side. Just don't do that. It's an unreasonable request. Do they ask for customizing the text so they can get their message out and play with the data? So I think where you make the separation is it's the difference between functionality is pretty bundled together and stays. Content should be infinitely flexible, is how you should think about it. Because it's their content, they own the content. But we're giving them a vehicle that's self-managing, that allows them to succeed and have that ability to upgrade as time goes on. If they don't have that ability, that, that's where most of the industry is stuck right now. And I'm not saying that from just a GE perspective, but everyone, that they've got antiquated systems and they can't really find a good reason to justify why to spend all the money if they're just going to have to customize all over it. So the promise has to be, we're not going to customize. We're going to give you a common solve 
and you're gonna custom up, you're gonna use custom pieces of it or pieces that you handpicked and put it together. And there might not be all the synergy you had before, but you'll probably find that you didn't need all of those either in many cases. Anything else? Did you have a question? Yeah, I was gonna yeah. ask you, do you see any trends related to the type of industry, the size, the, the maturity of a particular industry or company? I think the more, I mean, this may be a great obvious <laughs> way to put it, but I do think that the more technologically advanced um, manufacturers that actually create techno technologically advanced things like webcams, like iPhones, like uh, Galaxy tablets, th those folks, they're much more willing to adopt you know, and much more advanced to, to accelerate things and look at the world this way because, quite frankly, they're building their, their manufacturing facilities now. Right. Where, you, where you have a situation, and this somewhat exists in aviation, but because the price is so high for those, those particular goods, they can, they can afford to remanufacture because they're, they're charging enough to support that over time. But I, I think what the difference is, is that with a, an industry like, um, car auto manufacturers. They know that they're gonna change you know, their, their environment every year. Now granted, over time, they're definitely upgrading their systems so that they can tweak them and build different cars with the same machines. But nonetheless, that's been a painful process for them. So anyone that started in the 1800s doing something is gonna be a little bit tougher you know, and harder to adopt because they're still saying, well, wait a minute, I'm still putting on my product with the old stuff. What, are you, what am I going to get for, the, for that investment? But it's getting to the point, to be honest, it is getting to the point where we're at a break point. Where if they don't upgrade, you know, they'll, they'll flounder and die because someone else new will come in and figure out a way to do it 20 times faster than they do. And thus be that much cheaper. Did that answer the question? Yes, it does. Cool. Thank you. Any other questions before people grab a slide? Oh, maybe. Oh, yes. So in the, in the design process, you had one step when it comes to pivot or persevere? Yes. And I, I don't know if you've had the experience of working with a customer who's had to pivot, or any experience oh, yes. doing pivot. pivot. I'm with a company that has pivoted, and it's um, culturally, it's kind of tough. But I'm um, just wondering if you have an example of a, of a pivot. Sure. I mean, I, I think, I, I joked the other day that I think pivot should be a new, a new word that we brand for a new process. Because <laughs> we, we actually have a pivot process. Um, in terms of folks that, that pivot, uh, trying to think of a good example. So, a good example might be, I'll, I'll just use the GE example. Um, I'm making some of this up as I go along, so I'll be honest with you. But, but I'd say that that's a good example. So, for instance, before GE Lightning was all about selling light bulbs and manufacturing as many light bulbs as good in the whole nine yards, now they're about saving power. It's a totally different thing, you know, from, a, from an end customer perspective. We're going to convince you to throw away your old light bulbs to use the new ones, because not only is it intrinsically better for the environment, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But on top of that, it's going to save you money, so you should replace all the light bulbs. So your focus becomes different. It's like, I, I noticed the other day, just personally at Home Depot, people taking the incandescent light bulbs off the shelf and replacing them, literally with you know, newer renewable technologies, and literally swapping them out. So I, I think when you have that happen in the middle of a project, which is what I think you're talking about, mm -hmm. that, that kind of pivot where they go, hey, essentially our business model has changed. What do you do? I think what you have to do is you have to evaluate how much of the solve that you currently have done is applicable to whatever the new model and new hypothesis is, mm -hmm. and then bring them up to speed. I also think, obviously, it may, it may not be obvious to me, sometimes it's not, but obviously it's a rework. So how far back? Uh, you know, I always come into the any conversation like that, the numbers. Or the number experience part of now, what, what is the thought process that goes in there? I'm a software engineer and I, I, I leave that stuff for, for Joe because I, I just worry about writing the code in Joe's scriptures. I just, what we, what we write and uh, how it looks and what type of user experience I come up with. <laughs> so um, well, it was great to see two different perspectives.
the UX, UI, CX part, and also the end-to-end -end, uh, experience and, and the IIoT from the device to the cloud part, which Matthew uh, went over. It was a great uh, session. Uh, I hope everyone benefited from it. Um, hopefully in the future we'll have uh, more of those and uh, those joint sessions in two different perspectives. If you have any suggestions or comments or anything that you want to share with us, please reach out to me or me and the are sitting over there. And uh, please, if you have any topics that you want to uh, present here in the meetup, that would be great. If you work in, in this field, they, they probably have a lot of uh, stuff to show us and a lot of exciting stuff. Um, so please share with us. It would be great to, all, uh, to learn. Just to uh, tell you what we're uh, thinking here. Uh, in the future, we're thinking that we'll have a workshop around creatives. And uh, also, maybe after that, we'll have a hackathon on Pretext that will be open to uh, big audience. So, we're trying to organize those now and trying to see what is the best time to schedule those. And we'll uh, stay in touch with you and uh, let you know beforehand so that you're prepared for it. Okay? If you have any questions or comments, please share with us. Thank you for coming. Have a good night. Thank you.